Chapter Eleven of Martin Eden by Jack London. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter Eleven. Martin went back to his pearl diving article, which would have been finished sooner if it had not been broken in upon so frequently by his attempts to write poetry. His poems were love poems inspired by Ruth, but they were never completed. Not in a day could he learn to chant in noble verse. Rhyme and meter and structure were serious enough in themselves, but there was, over and beyond them, an intangible and evasive something that he caught in all great poetry, but which he could not catch and imprison in his own. It was the elusive spirit of poetry itself that he sensed and sought after, but could not capture. It seemed to glow to him, a warm and trailing vapor, ever beyond his reaching though sometimes he was rewarded by catching at shreds of it and weaving them into phrases that echoed in his brain, with haunting notes or drifted across his vision in misty wafture of unseen beauty. It was baffling. He ached with desire to express, and could but gibber prosaically, as everybody gibbered. He read his fragments aloud. The meter marched along on perfect feet, and the rhyme pounded a longer and equally faultless rhythm. But the glow and high exaltation that he felt within were lacking. He could not understand, and time and again, in despair, defeated and depressed, he returned to his article. Prose was certainly an easier medium. Following the pearl diving, he wrote an article on the sea as a career, another on turtle catching, and a third on the northeast trades. Then he tried, as an experiment, a short story and before he broke his stride he had finished six short stories and dispatched them to various magazines. He wrote prolifically, intensely, from morning till night, and late at night, except when he broke off to go to the reading room, draw books from the library, or to call on Ruth. He was profoundly happy. Life was pitched high. He was in a fever that never broke. The joy of creation that is supposed to belong to the gods was his. All the life about him, the odors of stale vegetables and soap suds, the slatternly form of his sister, and the jeering face of Mr. Higginbotham was a dream. The real world was in his mind, and the stories he wrote were so many pieces of reality out of his mind. The days were too short, there was so much he wanted to study. He cut his sleep down to five hours, and found that he could get along upon it. He tried four hours and a half and regretfully came back to five. He could joyfully have spent all his waking hours upon any one of his pursuits. It was with regret that he ceased from writing to study, that he ceased from study to go to the library, that he tore himself away from that chart-room of knowledge, or from the magazines in the reading-room that were filled with the secrets of writers who succeeded in selling their wares. It was like severing heart-strings, when he was with Ruth, to stand up and go and he scorched through the dark streets, so as to get home to his books at the least possible expense of time. And hardest of all was it to shut up the algebra or physics, put the notebook and pencil aside, and close his tired eyes in sleep. He hated the thought of ceasing to live, even for so short a time, and his sole consolation was that the alarm clock was set five hours ahead. He would lose only five hours anyway, and then the jangling bell would jerk him out of unconsciousness, and he would have before him another glorious day of nineteen hours. In the meantime, the weeks were passing, his money was ebbing low, and there was no money coming in. A month after he had mailed it, the adventure serial for boys was returned to him by the youth's companion. The rejection slip was so tactfully worded that he felt kindly toward the editor but he did not feel so kindly toward the editor of the San Francisco Examiner. After waiting two whole weeks, Martin had written to him. A week later he wrote again. At the end of the month, he went over to San Francisco and personally called upon the editor. But he did not meet that exalted personage, thanks to a Cerberus of an office boy, of tender years and red hair, who guarded the portals. At the end of the fifth week the manuscript came back to him, by mail, without comment. There was no rejection slip, no explanation, nothing. In the same way, his other articles were tied up with the other leading San Francisco papers. 
When he recovered them, he sent them to the magazines in the East, from which they were returned more promptly, accompanied always by the printed rejection slips. The short stories were returned in similar fashion. He read them over and over, and liked them so much that he could not puzzle out the cause of their rejection, until, one day, he read in a newspaper that manuscripts should always be typewritten. That explained it. Of course editors were so busy that they could not afford the time and strain of reading handwriting. Martin rented a typewriter and spent a day mastering the machine. Each day he typed what he composed, and he typed his earlier manuscripts as fast as they were returned to him. He was surprised when the typed ones began to come back. His jaw seemed to become squarer, his chin more aggressive, and he bundled the manuscripts off to new editors. The thought came to him that he was not a good judge of his own work. He tried it out on Gertrude. He read his stories aloud to her. Her eyes glistened, and she looked at him proudly as she said, "'Ain't it grand, you writin' those sort of things?' "'Yes, yes,' he demanded impatiently. "'But the story, how did you like it?' "'Just grand,' was the reply. "'Just grand and thrilling, too. I was all worked up.' He could see that her mind was not clear. The perplexity was strong in her good-natured face, so he waited. But, say, Mart, after a long pause, how did it end? Did the young man who spoke so highfalutin get her? And, after he explained the end, which he thought he had made artistically obvious, she would say, That's what I wanted to know. Why didn't you write that way in the story? One thing he learned, after he had read her a number of stories, namely, that she liked happy endings. That story was perfectly grand, she announced, straightening up from the wash-tub with a tired sigh and wiping the sweat from her forehead with a red, steamy hand. But it makes me sad. I want to cry. There is too many sad things in the world anyway. It makes me happy to think about happy things. Now, if he'd married her, and— You don't mind, Mart, she queried apprehensively. I just happen to feel that way, because I'm tired, I guess. But the story was grand just the same, perfectly grand. Where are you going to sell it? That's a horse of another color, he laughed. But if you did sell it, what do you think you'd get for it? Oh, a hundred dollars. That would be the least the way prices go. My, I do hope you'll sell it. Easy money, eh? Then he added proudly, I wrote it in two days. That's fifty dollars a day. He longed to read his stories to Ruth, but did not dare. He would wait till some were published, he decided. Then she would understand what he had been working for. In the meantime, he toiled on. Never had the spirit of adventure lured him more strongly than on this amazing exploration of the realm of mind. He bought the textbooks on physics and chemistry, and, along with his algebra, worked out problems and demonstrations. He took the laboratory proofs on faith and his intense power of vision enabled him to see the reactions of the chemicals more understandingly than the average student saw them in the laboratory. Martin wandered on through the heavy pages, overwhelmed by the clues he was getting to the nature of things. He had accepted the world as the world, but now he was comprehending the organization of it, the play and interplay of force and matter. Spontaneous explanations of old matters were continually arising in his mind. Levers and purchases fascinated him, and his mind roved backward to handspikes and blocks and tackles at sea. The theory of navigation, which enabled the ships to travel unerringly their courses over the pathless ocean, was made clear to him. The mysteries of storm and rain and tide were revealed, and the reason for the existence of trade winds made him wonder whether he had written his article on the northeast trade too soon. At any rate, he knew he could write it better now. One afternoon he went out with Arthur to the University of California, and, with bated breath and a feeling of religious awe, he went through the laboratories, saw demonstrations, and listened to a physics professor lecturing to his classes. But he did not neglect his writing. A stream of short stories flowed from his pen, and he branched out into the easier forms of verse, the kind he saw printed in the magazines. Though he lost his head and wasted two weeks on a tragedy in blank verse, the swift rejection of which, by half a dozen magazines, dumbfounded him. 
Then he discovered Henley and wrote a series of sea poems on the model of hospital sketches. They were simple poems of light and color and romance and adventure. Sea lyrics, he called them. And he judged them to be the best work he had done yet. There were thirty, and he completed them in a month, doing one a day after having done his regular day's work on fiction, which day's work was the equivalent to a week's worth of the average successful writer. The toil meant nothing to him. It was not toil. He was finding speech, all the beauty and wonder, that had been pent for years behind his inarticulate lips, was now pouring forth in a wild and virile flood. He showed the sea lyrics to no one, not even to the editors. He had become distrustful of editors, but it was not distrust that prevented him from submitting the lyrics. They were so beautiful to him that he was impelled to save them to share with Ruth in some glorious, far-off time when he would dare to read to her what he had written. Against that time he kept them with him, reading them aloud, going over them until he knew them by heart. He lived every moment of his waking hours, and he lived in his sleep, his subjective mind rioting through his five hours of surcease, and combining the thoughts and events of the day into grotesque and impossible marvels. In reality he never rested, and a weaker body or a less firmly poised brain would have been prostrated in a general breakdown. His late afternoon calls on Ruth were rarer now, for June was approaching, when she would take her degree and finish with the university, Bachelor of Arts. When he thought of her degree, it seemed she fled beyond him faster than he could pursue. One afternoon a week she gave to him, and arriving late, he usually stayed for dinner and for music afterward. Those were his red-letter days. The atmosphere of the house, in such contrast with that in which he lived, and the mere nearness to her, sent him forth each time with a firmer grip on his resolve to climb the heights. In spite of the beauty in him and the aching desire to create, it was for her that he struggled. He was a lover first and always. All other things he subordinated to love. Greater than his adventure in the world of thought was his love adventure. The world itself was not so amazing because of the atoms and molecules that composed it according to the propulsions of irresistible force. What made it amazing was the fact that Ruth lived in it. She was the most amazing thing he had ever known or dreamed or guessed. But he was oppressed always by her remoteness. She was so far from him, and he did not know how to approach her. He had been a success with girls and women in his own class. But he had never loved any of them, while he did love her, and besides, she was not merely of another class. His very love elevated her above all classes. She was a being apart, so far apart that he did not know how to draw near to her as a lover should draw near. It was true, as he acquired knowledge and language, that he was drawing nearer, talking her speech, discovering ideas and delights in common. But this did not satisfy his lover's yearning. His lover's imagination had made her holy, too holy, too spiritualized, to have any kinship with him in the flesh. It was his own love that thrust her from him, and made her seem impossible for him. Love itself denied him the one thing that it desired. And then, one day, without warning, the gulf between them was bridged for a moment, and thereafter, though the gulf remained, it was ever narrower. They had been eating cherries great, luscious, black cherries, with a juice the color of dark wine. And later, as she read aloud to him from the princess, he chanced to notice the stain of the cherries on her lips. For the moment her divinity was shattered. She was clay, after all, mere clay, subject to the common law of clay as his clay was subject, or anybody's clay. Her lips were flesh like his, and cherries dyed them as cherries dyed his. And if so with her lips, then was it so with all of her. She was woman, all woman, just like any woman. It came upon him abruptly. It was a revelation that stunned him. It was as if he had seen the sun fall out of the sky, or had seen worshipped purity polluted. Then he realized the significance of it, and his heart began pounding and challenging him to play the lover with this woman, 
who was not a spirit from other worlds, but a mere woman with lips a cherry could stain. He trembled at the audacity of his thought, but all his soul was singing, and reason, in a triumphant paean, assured him he was right. Something of this change in him must have reached her, for she paused from her reading, looked up at him, and smiled. His eyes dropped from her blue eyes to her lips, and the sight of the stain maddened him. His arms all but flashed out to her and around her, in the way of his old careless life. She seemed to lean toward him, to wait, and all his will fought to hold him back. "'You were not following a word,' she pouted. Then she laughed at him, delighting in his confusion, and as he looked into her frank eyes and knew that she had divined nothing of what he felt, he became abashed. He had indeed, in thought, dared too far. Of all the women he had known, there was no woman who would have not guessed, save her. And she had not guessed. There was the difference. She was different. He was appalled by his own grossness, awed by her clear innocence, and he gazed again at her across the gulf. The bridge had broken down. But still the incident had brought him nearer. The memory of it persisted, and in the moments when he was most cast down, he dwelt upon it eagerly. The gulf was never again so wide. He had accomplished a distance vastly greater than a bachelorship of arts, or a dozen bachelorships. She was pure, it was true, as he had never dreamed of purity, but cherries stained her lips. She was subject to the laws of the universe just as inexorably as he was. She had to eat to live, and when she got her feet wet she caught cold. But that was not the point. If she could feel hunger and thirst, and heat and cold, then she could feel love, and love for a man. Well, he was a man, and why could he not be the man? It's up to me to make good, he would murmur fervently. I will be the man. I will make myself the man. I will make good. End of chapter 11